What's going on, Champagne Gang? Fizz fam, confidants. <laughs> Welcome to the Reactorium for Secrets Spill. So listen, those of you who know, know that we just covered the case of Sonia Massey the other night. And I said in that video that I was going to be doing a follow-up. Well, in the midst of me working on my follow-up, I happened to run across a video on the channel of, let me get his name right, Indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie. And in this video, he's talking to two separate police officers about the case of Sonia Massey. One of the officers states the shooting was justified. The other officer stated the shooting was not. So what I want to do is get into it because you know me, I had to go do some research. So we're going to watch a few clips and then we're going to get into it. But first, take those glasses and raise them in the air. It's time for our positivity and affirmations those glasses filled to the rim let's go embrace the journey of inner exploration and trust in the wisdom that unfolds within you each experience no matter how small contributes to the tapestry of your spiritual growth you are a beacon of light destined to shine brightly with profound understanding so repeat after me i am a vessel of divine wisdom ever growing in spiritual insight and perfectly attuned to the world around me. Let's toast. So the whole premise of this video is to discuss whether or not you are allowed to protect yourself against the police. We know with the whole Sonia Massey issue, we have questions as to whether or not he was justified in pulling the trigger given she had the pot in her hand. Now, as I stated in my last video, I don't give a damn if she smacked it, flipped it, or rubbed it down threw it, tossed it, launched it, slid it. I don't give two flying, let me digress. <laughs> I wouldn't care what she did with the pot. The fact of the matter is when they first started telling her to put the pot down, the pot was already not in her hand. So in my opinion, she picked up the pot because you're trying to use the pot against me and I need to defend myself because you're approaching me with a weapon and I don't have one. So we're going to look at these two videos from Dr. Rashad and then we'll be back to discuss it because there's some important things that I need you to take a look at because I did look this up and what I found may just shock you. So we'll be right back. Take a look at these videos. Let's put up this screenshot for mass. Civil rights lawyer John H. Bryan gave a breakdown of the events of the shooting referencing the body cam of both cops. At 1.20 and 44 seconds, switching to Deputy Grace's body cam, we can see that at this time, the first time being told to drop the effing pot, Sonia raises her hands in the air and says, I'm sorry. You can see that image there. We made a steal for your review. Zooming in, we can see Sonia is not holding the pot that she's being ordered at gunpoint to drop. These are facts. The pot is on the stove, clearly seen. And Sonia has oven mitts in her hands, clearly seen. She also appears to be covering her ears and afraid. And Grayson shouts at her, drop the effing pot. The civil rights uh, lawyer notes 120 and 45. Sonia ducks down. At this moment, you hear the other deputy draw his pistol. He also yells at Sonia, drop the pot. So now two cops are screaming at her to drop a pot she's not holding. Ladies and gentlemen, these are facts. Two cops are screaming at her to drop a pot she is not holding. We have the evidence, okay? Go to the next one. At 120, 45 seconds, switching back to Deputy Grayson's body cam at that exact second, you can clearly see conclusively that Sonia did not take the pot with her when she dug down. It's still sitting on the counter. This is a zoomed in screenshot of that same still showing the pot is not in Sonia's possession. As she is ducking down in fear and confusion, she was undergoing a mental health crisis thinking a prowler was at the home. 12046. Let's switch back to Grayson's body cam which has a better view. When the other deputy joins Grayson in aiming their guns at Sonia and shouting at her, drop the pot that she's not holding. Once again, there's the pot is circled for you. Let's speed up one sec. Now I'm at 120 and 47 seconds. Deputy Grayson then begins to advance forward towards Sonia Massey, who has not moved from her position. She is ducking down on her kitchen floor as if she's somehow the perpetrator. 
Grayson is the one who begins to move instead of away from a perceived threat. He moves towards Sonny, okay? 120-47 switching back to Deputy Grayson's body cam. This is what he saw, which appears to be Sonya Massey going from being crouched with no pot to reaching up, grabbing the pot, mitt steel on her hands, and then holding the pot over her head. Could it be that she grabbed the pot, held it over her head because they kept telling her to drop the pot, drop the pot, drop the pot that she did not have in her hand? 120-48, switching again to the other deputy's body cam now. After Grayson shoots Massey, who did not threaten to throw water on anyone, you see what appears to be steam and water hit the officer's chair at lower left of the kitchen floor. That's when you saw water. So we got all of that right, a lot of which we discussed in the last video. If you haven't watched it, please go check it out because we do go through the entire video kind of frame by frame and discuss it. So now what we're going to get into is this officer who is on the panel with Dr. Rashad who is going to state that he feels like the shooting is justified. So let's check it out. We have officer Brandon Tatum, a member, former member of SWAT, CEO of three companies, and he is known for his YouTube channel talking about police conduct. Gentlemen, thank you both for being on the program. Thanks okay. for having us. Okay, um, here's what I want to do. Officer Tatum, you have taken the position that this police officer is justified. I would like you to explain your position, then I'm going to go um, to our other panelists for their opinion. What say you? All right, so I want to make sure we're clear here. Justification is not, uh, is he justified in the, in the death of this young lady? Justification is the justified use of force. So I, I don't condone any of his actions um, before the shooting. I don't think that he's a great officer with, with great reputation and I'm not supporting him whatsoever. Um, I'm saying that the use of force when she launched at the police officers with the pot, the use of deadly force was appropriate and justified in that particular instance. You're making an argument for the worst among us in policing. And you admit you did not like anything they did. You didn't like none of it. But brother, I hate to bring this home, man. Your mama living, Officer Tatum, huh? is your mama living? Yeah, my mama alive. My mother is not. If somebody did your mother that way in uniform, would you come on my show and defend them? I'm not defending... Yes, y'all do, brother. Come on, man. As if, no, listen, you. people saying like I'm defending it. Would like I'm you defending say this what officer. you're saying I'm if saying, this was your mother? I would say the was same thing. This way. I would Just, say the same thing because I'm going off of what the law says. I don't, you would say I don't if they like killed the, your mama? If if this officer killed, shot my mother after she threw a pot of boiling water Going at through him, a mental health episode. Yeah, they yeah, did not follow protocol. They did not de-escalate. You would still come on television in order to debate that they or that cop was still legally I'm in the I'm only right. debating the law. I, I, I don't care wow. for this cop. And I don't, I don't think that he did everything right. I think that he would have been probably worse off if he would have shot her the way they've been perpetuating it out in the news, that if she was just standing by the stove, she put her hands up and homeboy shot her because he thought she would throw a pot of boiling, boiling water. I mean, he would go to prison for the rest of his life. What I'm saying is that things begin to change when a person throws a, a pot of boiling water at him. I would have liked to see him do things differently. I would be very upset if that was my mom. I would have been very I, upset. I wouldn't right. like I'm, I'm upset that I'm upset that this woman lost her life. I don't think that they, I don't think that this should have resulted in that. But the law will dictate certain things when it comes to self-defense. And boiling water is a deadly weapon because a person can get seriously injured, dismembered. I mean, not dismembered, but um, get seriously injured but it's, it's and not, it's disfigured. Not for life. No, sir, it's not considered a deadly weapon. It, 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 it is, is a deadly a weapon. According to Illinois law, a boiling pot of water is a deadly weapon. No, it's not consi it it's, is. It's considered. No, sir. Look at the ruling, sir. It's not I know the, the ruling. The ruling says, Doctor Richie. The ruling says that the water was the deadly weapon, and deadly force was justified in that scenario. However, they are arguing that he put himself in a situation that should not necessitate a deadly. But I want you to understand the difference between a deadly weapon, which is categorized by instrumentation, and the use of deadly force. The court made the distinction. You see, the the device or the pot itself is not a deadly weapon. They talked about what the what the officer subjectively believed was the deadly weapon. That was the contextualization of the court, not the not the category of the pot or of the um, boiling water. So in listening to this officer speak 
and knowing the details of the case with Sonia Massey, I had to do some investigating and discovering, right? Because I wanted to know when are individuals allowed to protect themselves when they're dealing with the police? Because you can't tell me that self-defense is a one-way street when you're dealing with the police. You cannot convince me that the police can claim self-defense, but if they are the aggressors and doing something unlawful, illegal, or teetering on the borderline of illegal, that I don't have the right to protect myself. So I went looking and searching, you know me, because I want to bring you the facts. So I found this website and it is called soundlawyering.com. And it poses this question. When is it legal to use force against a police officer? The short answer is practically never. Keyword, practically. So it doesn't say that you can never do it. It just says practically never. So I wanted to continue reading so that I could see what it said. Hope your glasses are filled because we're about to go through this. So it says, historically a suspect had the right to resist an unlawful arrest by a police officer so long as the force applied was proportional to the threat presented. And it says, see State versus Rosu. So I found the exact case and I'm going to summarize it for you. But the link so you can read it on your own will be in the description. But it says the state of Wisconsin versus Harold R. Rosu or Rosso, however it's pronounced. So it says Harold R. Rosso appealed his conviction for second degree burglary, arguing that a Swiss watch used as evidence against him was obtained through an unlawful search and arrest and thus should have been suppressed. So here are the key events. A Seattle police officer observed Rosso, known to be an ex-convict, attempting to pawn a valuable Swiss watch. Apparently, the watch was worth hundreds of dollars. Suspecting foul play, the officer arrested Rosso and found additional watches on him during a search, but allowed Rosso to keep them initially. Rosu's arrest was later deemed unlawful as the officer did not know the watch was stolen at the time, right? So here's what happened during the arrest. While being taken to his car, Rosu unhandcuffed, pushed the officer into traffic and fled. The officer pursued and eventually apprehended Rosu after he was hit by a car during his escape attempt. Upon the second arrest, the watches were confiscated. So here are the legal issues. Number one, first arrest and search. It was unlawful as the officer lacked knowledge that the watch was stolen. The second arrest and search. Rosu's forceful resistance, pushing the officer into traffic, was deemed excessive and constituted a criminal assault. The court ruled the second arrest lawful due to Rosu's unjustified assault, thus making the evidence, the Swiss watch, admissible. So here was the court's decision. The court upheld the decision to admit the Swiss watch as evidence because the second arrest was lawful. It was concluded that the use of excessive force by Rosu in resisting arrest justified his second apprehension. So here are the key legal principles. Number one, resistance to unlawful arrest. Individuals may resist unlawful arrest, but the force used must be reasonable and proportionate. Excessive force, especially actions that could cause severe harm or death, are not justified. Admissibility of evidence. Evidence obtained from a lawful arrest following excessive resistance to an initially unlawful arrest is admissible. So the conclusion of this case is Rosu's excessive use of force during his escape attempt rendered his second arrest lawful. This decision highlights that while resisting an unlawful arrest is permissible, the resistance must be reasonable and not endanger the officer's life. As a result, evidence obtained from the subsequent lawful arrest can be used in court. This case underscores the nuanced balance between individual rights and law enforcement authority, particularly in the context of self-defense and resisting arrest.
So basically what they're saying is just because an individual is an ex-con, you cannot assume that something that they have on their possession is stolen, right? Because that was the situation with Mr. Rosu. He was an ex-con. He went in a pawn shop to attempt to pawn a Swiss watch and there was the automatic assumption that it was stolen because he did not give his correct name. So the police attempted to arrest him and he resisted. Where he made the mistake at, according to this case, is that his level of resistance did not match the level of the unlawful arrest. He was not being restrained. The officer was not being forceful, but he pushed the officer in the, tr in the street so he could retreat. So what the court is saying, your level of resistance has to be proportioned to the level of the arrest. All the while making it crystal clear that as a civilian, as an individual, you do have the right to resist unlawful arrest. Now we're going to be looking at a few different cases with this one, but it goes on to say an illegal arrest is an assault and battery. The person so attempted to be restrained of his liberty has the same right and only the same right to use force in defending himself as he would have in repelling any other assault and battery. Had the appellant merely attempted to escape from the officer by flight, there would be no question but that the second arrest was as illegal as the first. It says every man, however guilty, has a right to shun an illegal arrest by flight. The exercise of this right should not and would not subject him to be arrested as a fugitive. And it goes on to say Thomas v. State cited with approval in Porter v. State. So we're going to take a look at this Thomas v. State. So this is Thomas v. State, Supreme Court of Georgia, October 8th, 1982. Key points. Number one, error in jury instruction on resisting arrest. The court instructed the jury that they are not trying the question of resisting an officer, but whether an assault and battery occurred. Now, because remember, it is considered assault and battery when you are illegally arrested by the police. That was established in the previous case. This was assigned as an error because the jury was not instructed about the legality of resisting an unlawful arrest. On a timely written request, the court refused to charge the jury that a person being unlawfully arrested has the right to resist with force proportionate to that being used by the officer. This includes using necessary force to protect oneself if the officer's actions create a reasonable fear of injury. Remember that, right? And number two, defendant's right to resist illegal arrest. The case was based on the theory that the defendant assaulted police officer Rickman. If the arrest was illegal, the defendant had the right to resist with necessary force. Previous rulings, Mullis v. State and Yates v. State, supported the principle that resisting an illegal arrest with proportionate force does not constitute a crime. The state's contention was that the defendant used some force to resist a legal arrest, while the defense argued it was to resist an illegal arrest. The critical issue was whether the arrest was legal, affecting the defendant's right to resist. So now legal requirements for arrest without warrant. Code 27-207 outlines that an officer can only arrest without a warrant if the offense is committed in their presence. The offender is trying to escape or there is likely to be a failure of justice without immediate arrest. In this case, there was no evidence the defendant committed a crime in the officer's presence or was trying to escape. The officer claimed the defendant was drunk and arrested him for disorderly conduct, but no evidence of public drunkenness or city ordinances was provided. The officer radioed another officer for assistance instead of obtaining a warrant, making the arrest illegal, allowing the defendant to use proportionate force in resisting. Error requiring reversal. 
The trial court's refusal to charge the jury on the legality of resisting an unlawful arrest, combined with the misleading instruction that the jury was not concerned with resisting an officer, constituted reversible error. The defendant was entitled to have the jury consider the lawfulness of the arrest in connection with his defense. Failure to charge this principle and the erroneous instruction led to the necessity of reversing the decision. So in a quote directly from the case, it says, I charge you that one upon whom an arrest is unlawfully being made by an officer, that such person sought to be arrested has the right to resist force with force proportionate to that being used in detaining him. And that if such arrest or attempted arrest by such an officer is unlawful and in the progress of the transaction, the officer is about to commit an injury upon the party whom he seeks to unlawfully arrest and so acts and makes a show of violence as to excite in the person sought to be arrested the fears of a reasonable man that an injury is about to be committed upon him and such person acts under the influence of those fears and not in a spirit of revenge he may protect himself although it may be necessary to injure the officer for that purpose. It goes on to say, the case here was made on the theory that the defendant committed an assault upon the police officer Rickman. If this attempted arrest was illegal, the defendant had a right to resist the same, using as much force as would be necessary to do so. Mullis versus State. Obviously, the defendant used no more force than was necessary to resist the arrest. It appears that he failed to use enough to effectuate this purpose since the undisputed evidence shows that he was in fact arrested. If the attempted arrest was legal, he had no right whatsoever to resist it. If it was illegal, he had the right to resist with all the force necessary for that purpose. Yates v. State As was held in Jenkins v. State If the force of resistance is not in excess of the force of invasion and is used solely for the purpose of prevention, no offense is committed. The Star 82 is not contended by the state that the defendant used too much force to resist an illegal arrest. The contention being that he used some force to resist legal arrest. Therefore, the very gravamen of the offense here charged is an assault upon a police officer engaged in making a legal arrest. Since the repulsion by proportionate force of a legal arrest does not constitute a crime. So basically, here's the case. This man lived in a home. Um, apparently, he got into his wife's significant other or whatever. The daughter went to the police station and told the police he was being abusive. Three hours later, the police show up on scene. The woman tells the police that he stole $29 from her or something like that. The police attempt to arrest him, but he finds fights back. In the process, police pull a gun on him, he pulls a gun on them, he fires, feeling his life is in danger. When he's finally arrested and goes to court, the court fails to let the jury know that an individual can defend themselves and resist arrest if the arrest is illegal. So apparently he was convicted on this and it looks like from what I'm getting, he appealed to have it overturned because there was a misrepresentation of the law in the case and the jury was not made aware that if an officer attempts to arrest you and it is an illegal arrest you have the right to resist this is why I keep telling y'all you have to know your rights have to know your rights in this day and age know what you can do know what you can't do know what they can do and know what they can't do so now both of these cases were early 1980s. So now back to soundlawyering.com. And it says by 1985, apparently all of the four mentioned had changed. This belief was expressed in State v. Holman. In that decision, the basis for the court's modern understanding of the law, the case wrote, The arrestee's right to freedom from arrest without excessive force that falls short of causing serious injury or death 
can be protected and vindicated through legal processes, whereas loss of life or serious physical injury cannot be repaired in a courtroom. However, in the vast majority of cases, as illustrated by the one at bar, resistance and intervention make matters worse, not better. They create violence where none would have otherwise existed or encourage further violence, resulting in a situation of arrest by combat. Police today are sometimes required to use lethal weapons for self-protection. If there is resistance on behalf of a person lawfully arrested and others go to his aid, the situation can degenerate to the point that what should have been a simple lawful arrest leads to serious injury or death to the arrestee, the police, or innocent bystanders. Orderly and safe law enforcement demands that an arrestee not resist a lawful arrest and a bystander not intervene on his behalf unless the arrestee is actually about to be seriously injured or killed. So the article goes on to say defendants cannot raise self-defense against a police officer, right? It says popular wisdom among defense attorneys today is that a defendant thus cannot raise self-defense against a police officer, regardless of whether they were unlawfully arrested or whether they were assaulted by a police officer in the process, unless they actually first die or are severely maimed by the police officer's use of excessive force. In fact, the pattern jury instruction reads, a person may use force to resist an arrest by someone known by a person to be a police officer only if the person being arrested is in actual and imminent danger of serious injury from an officer's use of excessive force. It says, however, acceptance of this instruction should be challenged. State versus Smith's 1990 suggested that if an arrest is unlawful, the defendant may be justified in exercising self-defense against a police officer if the defendant reasonably believed they were in danger of serious bodily injury from a police officer's use of force. It's an uphill battle to be sure, but given the public's changing attitude towards law enforcement, it's an argument worth making for some clients charged with assault three, resisting arrest and other crimes. So now when we're dealing with the situation of Sonia Massey, there was the concern of whether or not he was able to use the force he used and whether or not it was reasonable. So I found this information that I'm about to give you on police.ucla.edu and it says factors used to determine the reasonableness of force when determining whether or not to apply any level of force and evaluating whether an officer has used reasonable force a number of factors should be taken into consideration these factors include but are not limited to the conduct of the individual being confronted as reasonably perceived by the officer at the time officer slash subject factors, age, size, relative strength, skill level, injury slash exhaustion, and number of officers versus subject, influence of drugs slash alcohol, mental capacity, proximity of weapons, the degree to which the subject has been effectively restrained, and his or her ability to resist despite being restrained, time and circumstances permitting, the availability of other options, what resources are reasonably available to the officer under the circumstances, seriousness of the suspected offense or reason for contact with the individual, training and experience of the officer, potential injury to the public, officers and suspects, risk of escape, and other exigent circumstances. So now let's look at some definitions. Active aggression is known as a threat or overt act of an assault through physical or verbal means coupled with the present ability to carry the threat or assault out, which reasonably indicates that an assault or injury to a person appears imminent. Same website. Actively resisting. Evasive physical movements to defeat an officer's attempt at control, including bracing, tensing, pushing, or verbally signaling 
an intention to avoid or prevent being taken into custody. Force. Any physical effort used to control, restrain, or overcome the resistance of another. The reasonable application of force requires awareness of the facts and circumstances of each particular situation, including the severity of the crime at issue, whether the suspect poses an immediate threat to the safety of the officers, or whether the subject is actively resisting arrest or attempting to evade arrest by flight. It is recognized that officers are expected to make split-second decisions and the amount of an officer's time available to evaluate and respond to changing circumstances may impact his or her decision. Passive resistance. Physical actions that do not prevent the officer's attempt to control a subject. For example, a subject who remains in a sitting, standing, limp, or prone position with no physical contact, locked arms, with another individual. The subject in handcuffs meets the definition of passive resistance if A. The subject is in a sitting, standing, or prone position as directed by the officer and is not engaged in any motion reasonably likely to injure, resist, or remove handcuffs, or B. The subject is walking accompanied by and following the directions of an officer. A subject who, while sitting or standing, has locked arms with another subject is not engaged in passive resistance but is engaged in proactive action to obstruct. A subject who has previously engaged in passive resistance but who subsequently engages in behavior such as flailing, kicking, elbowing, headbutting, biting, shoving, jerking, pulling away, twisting, or other action that an officer interprets as a threat or actual act of active resistance is no longer considered to be engaging in passive resistance. So now why would this be important in the case of Sonia Massey? Number one, she called them because she felt she was in danger. She was not under arrest nor a suspect of arrest. She called for help. Number two, the threat to her was not inside her home. It was outside. Number three, he told her he didn't see anyone outside, although there was the damaged car in the driveway with the broken windshield and side windows that wasn't addressed but possibly corroborated her fear for safety. No further attention was given to that threat. Now mind you, I don't know if the other officers saw it, but he did. Number four, he asked her if she needed anything else and she said no, he could have left. Number five, he asked her her name for his report. She didn't give it, he could have left. Six, he entered the house when he didn't need to, he could have left. Seven, he harassed her for her ID, which she didn't have to provide. Eight, he again, I say, he gave her the instruction to take the pot off the stove. He didn't need to because he didn't need to be there that long. Number nine, he approaches the counter, the partner backs away. Number 10, he instructs her to put down a pot. She complied, no threat. 11, he continued to tell her to drop the pot she didn't have and she was cowering on the floor. Number 12, he approaches her with a weapon drawn telling her to drop the pot she didn't have, then she grabs it. 13. She had no burns from the boiling water, if in fact it was boiling because it could have just been steamy. 14. She was not under arrest, so she was never a threat. They were there on a call for her safety, and she ended up fearing for her safety from them. He was the initiator because if he would have just never told her to get the pot, she would have never been by the stove. She had every right according to the law to defend herself. So in answering our question, you have every right to protect yourself and protect your rights against police who are attempting to violate them. She was justified. They weren't. And I'm starting to think there are a lot of people who need to find real lawyers 
because you know the public defenders, public pretenders aren't going to effectively defend you. Sometimes I think some of them are working for the prosecution. <laughs> yeah, but some of y'all need to get real lawyers to look into some of these resisting arrest and assault against an officer charges because they could be illegal. A lot of the time, officers feel they are the ultimate authority and you have to just comply because they are the officers. But they are governed by rules and laws as well. A pot is not considered a deadly weapon. A weapon, yes, but as stated, the amount of force used must match the threat. He was in no danger, so she shouldn't have been. And I'm still saying, why hasn't the other officer come forth to tell his side of the story and what he thought? Because his perspective is just as valid to this case because he pulled the gun as well. Drop in the comments and let me know what you think about this one. Let's talk about it. Email me at champagnesecrets at gmail.com or DM me on Instagram at champagnesecrets with any questions or if you would like to see more videos on topics such as this let me know in the comment thank you for joining us if you enjoyed the video consider hitting that like button consider joining the champagne gang and the fizz fam click that subscribe button and the notification bell so you'll be notified when we jump into whichever sector we jump into for another show confidence Always remember, if it doesn't cause you to elevate, it's causing you to depreciate. Now raise those glasses, clink, and let's drink till we meet again. Ta-ta.